So if you got your Bibles, turn in them to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'll meet you there in a second, okay? And that's going to be our text for today. Um, and uh, we're walking through uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Only have a couple more messages now uh, before the end, and then we'll transition into Christmas. And then after that, we're going to be verse by verse through the book of Ephesians, starting in the new year, 2023. Um, but we've entitled this sermon series, The Good Life. It's because um, we get to realize um, how hopeless life is without Jesus. We get to understand that without God, life is uh, meaningless. And uh, chapter after chapter, verse by verse, Solomon, who has been our teacher or preacher, he's the one that's been showing us the futility of life apart from God. And si since we get to see all of the various things that don't satisfy us in the book of Ecclesiastes, we're reminded that through Christ now, we can be satisfied. We can have life. We have the power to enjoy life and to be thankful for the life that God has given us through his grace, by faith, through and in Jesus Christ. Um, and so we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Um, God reveals himself to mankind, and this is called revelation. Not only is it not only is it just uh, the, the last book of the Bible, it's the way that God reveals himself. Now theologians have broken down this revelation of God into a couple different categories, all right? And this is going to help us as we get to uh, chapter 9 here. The first way that God reveals himself to us is uh, through something called general revelation. General revelation. This is God revealing himself uh, in nature. This is God revealing himself through the sunrise or the sunset or the Rocky Mountains or what's your favorite place to see God and the handiwork of God? Do you have a favorite place uh, for that? Psalm chapter 19 says this, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. The speech of the heavens and the earth and the glory of God is on display in all of nature. This is general revelation. One of the favorite places that I experienced the presence of God is in a place in Norway. It's called um, Pulpit Rock or Prekestolen in uh, Norwegian. And I got to go there my first year of college and you hike up like three hour hike up this mountain and then you get up to this pulpit rock and it says it's pulpit rock because it's like a pulpit. It's like this right here except sheer rock face all the way down 2,000 feet uh, from the ground up that sheer rock wall to the top. And there uh, that's not me. I didn't get that close to the edge, okay? I never got that close to the edge. It was, it was uh, amazing. And uh, I think there's another one, and you can kind of see it off in the distance. That's, you see the fjord, and you see the mountains, and you're on top of this, uh, you know, Sears Tower. It's not called Sears Tower, but I still call it Sears Tower. It is um, 1,729 feet to the top of the tip of the tallest point of Sears Tower, and uh, that's 2,000 feet. So you're on a, the biggest skyscraper ever overlooking this beautiful fjord. The heavens declare the glory of God. And then uh, we see in Romans chapter 1, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. There's no excuse. I mean, God is seen throughout all of creation. And it's the height of ignorance. It is stupidity to look around at the complexity of the universe and to just say, it probably all came from nothing. To look at the way that you have been made and the, and the consciousness that you've been given, the life that you have, and to say that it came from nothing is the height of ignorance. It's the denial of the very creator God of heaven and earth. The heavens declare the glory of God. God reveals himself in general revelation. But he also reveals himself in this second one, jot this down, special revelation. Special revelation. This is God um, supernaturally, uh, above and beyond nature, in a miraculous way, letting himself be made known to people. And so this happens like in dreams, it happens in visions, although those are very rare. 
I mean, they're very rare in the whole Bible, which encompasses thousands of years. It's rare. So if you got a friend who like has a vision every other day about God speaking to him, uh, I would be very questioning of that, okay? Um, but God reveals himself in his word. We have the word of God, and, and that's why we come together and we learn from it. And I preach from it because God reveals himself through the pages of this book. But you know the number one way, the, the special revelation from God to us, the way that he revealed himself is through the man named Darren. Now it's time for Jesus. Last week he said King Jesus for King Saul in the Old Testament. And now I, I set you up for a home run. Jesus. Yes, thank you. There you go. So Jesus is the, 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 the word of God revealed. The, uh, the word of God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God is revealed through the God man, Jesus Christ. And so you look to his life, and we always look to his life. You look to his death, and we believe and count on his death. We look to the resurrection and the empty tomb, and we believe that uh, Jesus has conquered sin, death, and the devil, and he is God in the flesh, redeeming a people for himself, the people of God. And we believe, and we know, and we have this revelation of God, who he is in Jesus Christ, the Son. But not only that, we have the Son for us, and and he lives in us through the power of his spirit. And he works through his word then that we have. And so we open up the word. And all of God's word is profitable. Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All of this book is profitable for us. That was a great spot for an amen. All of this book is profitable for us. And, and it is true, but here's, here's, the, here's the point. Um, not all of it is as applicable as some of it is. Okay? Here, and and uh, here's what I mean. It's not demeaning any different parts of the Bible. It's just that there are some parts that are more applicable to us in where we live than in other parts of it. Now, I'm not saying that we avoid the parts that are hard, because that would be a very easy thing to do. Parts that are difficult, the types that are hard, the parts that go against our culture and our time and our day and age, we just skip over those and, and they're not as applicable to us. That's not what I'm saying at all. Here's what I'm talking about. It's a third type of revelation. It's called progressive revelation, okay? You have general revelation in nature. You have a special revelation God revealed miraculously, ultimately through the Son, Jesus. But then you have something called progressive revelation. Progressive revelation is that um, God has revealed himself and his plan for mankind uh, um, um, a little bit at a time. And he, he didn't give us the whole plan back in Genesis. He's revealed his plan as time has gone on. For example, in salvation. How is a person saved? Here's this chart. Here's um, the death of Christ is right in the middle, okay? Progressive Revelation says the Old Testament, those people, they had to have faith in the coming Messiah. They had to have faith in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus. But they didn't know his name. They didn't know the Messiah. They gave sacrifices. They made them. They didn't understand that Jesus was going to be the ultimate sacrifice. But the people of God had to look forward to Christ. And now we're the New Testament Christians. We're the church Christians. And, and we are the believers, the people of God who look back on the death of Christ. And we see the Messiah. And we understand who Jesus is. And so we've been granted, this is a good thing too, we've been granted the gift of this increasing revelation of God to man. And we have beheld Jesus, the glory of God in the Son. And it's an amazing thing. And so we look back on Christ. We talk about him all the time. We sing to him and worship him. He's been revealed to us. And so this is um, an illustration of this progressive revelation. Now there's other examples that you could talk about. You could talk about the laws of God and how they've been pro progressively revealed to us too. For example, in the Old Testament, they have dietary laws. Dietary laws about what you can eat and when you can't eat. And then in the New Testament, God revealed to Peter, you remember that when he had the dream, the vision of, uh, of these animals that were unclean and God saying, no, you can eat them. There's no unclean and clean animals. How many people are thankful you don't have to follow the dietary laws anymore? Yes, very thankful. We're going to have a good potluck after this service, okay? Some of you made pork uh, sandwiches. Uh, yeah, so um, 
we wouldn't be able to do that unless it was for prog progressive revelation. Uh, how about circumcision? Um, you used to have to be circumcised to be a part of the people of God. And now uh, circumcision isn't um, a mark of the people of God. Okay? And, uh, and so th things have kind of shifted and changed. By the way, not all things have gotten easier, by the way, in progressive revelation. Do you know that? For example, adultery in the Old Testament. You don't commit adultery. It's sin. God hates divorce. But if you need to get divorced, give, write a certificate of divorce and get it over with. Move on in your life. In the New Testament, Jesus says don't commit adultery. And he says even if you look with lust on another woman or another man, if you look with lust, that's committing adultery. Jesus made it harder. Progressive revelation. So this is uh, where we're at. Now, the reason why I say all that is to say this. Solomon's going to say some things. And um, he's a thousand years before Jesus. And it's not that we're going to correct him, um, but we're just going to look at the greater story and understand a little bit more which, what he did not have the luxury to understand. And we, um, by God's grace and mercy, do. And so that's going to come up here uh, in the second uh, chapter, or second part of chapter 9. So go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. The title of the message is Enjoy the Good Life. Enjoy the Good Life. How many people want to enjoy their life? Let me just see your hands. And it's okay. And, and I know you can be super spiritual and say, well, I want to glorify God with my life. And I, that's awesome. I do too. But do you want to enjoy your life? That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing to have a great life. If you want to enjoy your life, he's going to tell us some things here in light of uh, some other things uh, can help us to enjoy it better. And look at verse 1 of... Uh, Ecclesiastes 9. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds in the hand of God, whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and to the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices, to him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns the oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to us all. Also the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgiven, or forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. You want to enjoy life? The first point is this. Enjoy life because death is coming. Because death is coming. Solomon says, uh, death is assured. For the wicked, for the righteous, for the clean, for the unclean. He says for the religious and for the irreligious. The one who does sacrifice, the one who doesn't sacrifice. We could add this. Whether you're white or black, or you're brown or yellow, no matter what your nationality, no matter what your tribe, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you have a job or you're looking for work, everyone, everyone will have to face death unless... Jesus Christ returns, okay? And he could. He could return. He could return at the end of this message today. And uh, what a glorious thing that would be. That would be an awesome thing. You think, well, wait a second. My, my boy's got a big wrestling meet this week. We can wait after that. And let, let this, no. You think the wrestling meet's going to compare to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords setting up his kingdom here on earth where you get to rule and reign with him? That's going to be an amazing day. We want that day to happen. We pray for that day. Your kingdom come. Thy will be done, we pray. Um, but we don't know when that is going to happen. And so we... Um, I don't know about you, but I don't like the thought of dying. So I like to think that Jesus is going to come back in my lifetime. And I think that's the way many Christians have thought. And that's a better thought, right? Because then you don't have to think about dying. Who wants to think about dying? And so we say, well, maybe Jesus is coming back today. Um, but the reality is, um, he may, but he may not. And if he doesn't, death is assured for us. He goes on to say, living is better than dying. You see that there? He says, even a, a live dog is better than a dead lion, he says. Now, 
If you recall, this is a little bit different from what he said in chapter 6. In chapter 6, he said to somebody who hadn't been born, a stillborn person, was better off than the person who lives in, in, uh, in life. Like, uh, that's a good thing. Um, not the ending, the good thing of not being born. And um, he says that for certain circumstances, life is so difficult and life is so wicked and life is so meaningless that it would be better for some people never to have been born. Would have been better for Pottersville to have existed, right? But here he says, um, living is better than dying. It is better. Even a live dog is better than a dead lion. Man, life is an incredible gift of God. Incredible gift. Have you given any thought to the miraculous fact that you're alive sitting here today? Um, people much smarter than me, statisticians and people who do odds, um, they've come up with the uh, chances of you being alive, the, 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 um, the chance that you're here today. You know what that, uh, that number is? I don't know exactly what the number is, but here is what the odds are that you have life, that you have life in your life. The odds are um, the same as if you have a turtle and the turtle's in the oceans. One of the oceans on, in the world, there's one turtle and you have one uh, circular ring life preserver thing, right? And what do you call those things? I don't know what you call those things, but you all know what I'm talking about, right? It's like a giant donut, right? And, uh, and so you throw that out into the ocean somewhere. And now that turtle comes and he comes to get a breath and he comes up and his head comes up into that uh, life-saving ring and he takes a breath. That is the chance that you have to be alive. That's the odds that you overcame. Now that's a gift of God that you are here today. That's an amazing thing. Think of that incredible gift of life. We just take it for granted because we don't know all the people that aren't alive, right? God has given us an incredible gift. You're alive. Life is a good thing. Life is better than dying. Then he goes on, he says, death is the end of living. And you're like, duh, death is the end of living. Um, but he says work and relationships and rewards and emotions. Solomon says, all this is over. And then he ends in verse 10. He says, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. He's saying, it's all over. Now, this was the limit to Solomon's wisdom. He had an under, underdeveloped theology of the afterlife. And we've talked about this before. We've talked about Sheol. You remember that? And for the ancient uh, Israelite, uh, the afterlife wasn't very well thought out or planned out or dissected or disseminated or God didn't reveal it all to them. And, and they had this general idea that Sheol was the place of the dead. It was divided into two parts. One part was Hades. The other part was paradise or Abraham's bosom. And we even see that in Jesus. He starts speaking about the rich man and Lazarus, and he has that same setup of the afterlife. But see, something changed with Jesus on the cross. Something changed with Jesus in the resurrection. Because Jesus made a sacrifice for the sin of, of his people, and the sin of mankind, uh, he was able to take the people who are in paradise, the people of God, and bring them to the very presence of God himself. And so um, now, today... Uh, when we die, there's uh, the heaven that is right now in the presence of God, in the presence of Christ, with other believers who have gone before. And there's also still Hades. Um, here's what we know about heaven, okay? Here's what we know about the life that's to come. Every person dies and faces the judgment of God. Some people will go to heaven and some people will go to hell. Those who have faith in Christ will be saved from the wrath of God. Now there are two different heavens. Not that there's two different places and not that there's a purgatory. It's just there's two different stages of heaven. The heaven that exists right now is called the intermediate heaven. And it's the place that you go if you were to die now. And um, I've said it many times, if I fall over dead right here, right now, my spirit goes to be with Jesus, along with um, people who've gone before. It's going to be a glorious thing. My spirit goes, my body stays here. 
Um, I'll, I'll be up in heaven. It'd be a wonderful thing. You'll be left with my carcass sitting here, super uncomfortable, but at least you have a story to tell at Christmas. My <laughs> pastor died right on stage during the sermon. Anyway, so, so um, the, the body stays here, and you bury it, or you cremate it, or whatever happens to the body. You got eaten by sharks in the ocean. Whatever happens, your spirit goes to be uh, with the Lord Jesus along with those who have gone before. There's continuity from this life to the next life. You don't become an angel. Um, you're recognizable to other people. You say, oh, well, you don't have a body. How are you recognizable? I don't know, but think about the transfiguration. When Jesus transfigured and uh, he changed before his disciples, before he went to the cross. And there was two people from the Old Testament who met with Jesus. And those two people's names were Moses and uh, E. Elijah. Enoch? No, uh, no, but uh, Enoch didn't die. Uh, Moses and Elijah and Peter and the disciples see him and see them. And uh, Peter says, um, hey, Jesus, should we build a, uh, a shrine for Moses and Elijah? Now, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? There's two spirits that appeared. We don't know. Did Peter have the yearbook for Moses and Elijah? Did he recognize him? No. He, he knew supernaturally by their spirit. And that's uh, what we would think of now as we go to heaven now to be with the Lord right now. Um, we have spirit. But there's coming a day what uh, scriptures tell us is the new heavens and the new earth. Or the final heaven, you could say. And this is when Jesus returns. And it's when his people receive their resurrection bodies. Uh, their supernatural bodies. Like the body Jesus had when he rose from the dead. And Jesus could eat with the disciples on the beach and eat fish. And he could miraculously appear in the, in, in, behind locked doors with the disciples. He had this miraculous body. He still knew it was him. He still had the scars on his, on his skin. Um, uh, but this is the day that is to come with resurrection bodies. And your body, whether it's buried, whether it's cremated, whether it's been eaten by animals, God is going to supernaturally take those cells and those atoms and reconstruct your body and you're going to have the super body. You're going to live and rule and reign in this new heavens and the new earth where there's no more cancer, where there's no more sickness, where there's no more sin, amen, and where there's no more funeral homes. And, uh, and you're going to rule and reign with him. You're going to have a job to do. It's going to be a miraculous thing, a great thing. You're like, wait a second here. That sounds pretty fantastical. You really believe that? You really believe in the resurrection? You really believe in a, a new heavens and a new earth and a day when Jesus is going to reign like that? I mean, it sounds, it sounds uh, incredible. It does. But think of this. How incredible is it that you are here right now and you have life? How incredible is it that you have consciousness? How incredible is it that you have something that scientists cannot figure out? That you have life. They can't recreate life. They can't make life. They can't have consciousness in all the talk about AI and all that stuff. They don't have consciousness. That's not, it's not here. It's not possible outside of God. And so the fact that you're here, the fact that the sun's shining, the fact that you can eat food and have an, a great life and enjoy life, that's as incredible as the life that's yet to come. I'm glad, by the way, that we live today and I'm glad and thankful for the promise of heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. I love this verse. It says, Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, or the mind even conceived of the good things that God has planned for those who love him. Do you love him? God's got some great plans for you ahead. So I don't know about you, but I'm glad that we live in this day and age, and we have been recipients of this revelation I'm thankful that I'm not back in Solomon's day and I have some idea of like the afterlife, but I don't really know. And it's kind of like, well, I hope everything's going to be okay. I, I do trust in God and God's going to take care of me. Uh, I'm, I'm the type of guy that likes to plan ahead a little bit more. And, uh, and the teaching that the, the word of God gives us, that Christ himself gives us about our heavenly home brings comfort to my soul. If you want to learn more about heaven, I always recommend this book. It's one of my favorites. It's called Heaven by Randy Elkhorn. He does such a great job of going through uh, scriptures, all the scriptures on heaven. He does speculate at places, but he distinguishes what his speculations are and what the Word of God says. And I just think I just would uh, recommend it strongly to you. Heaven by Randy Elkhorn. So enjoy life. Live it to the fullest. Make the most of it. Because even what you do in this life impacts the life that's yet to come. Invest 
in the only thing that you can take to heaven, that's relationships. Invest in other people's lives, and you can take those relationships along. Jesus says it this way. He says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy. Store up for yourselves eternal things as you live and enjoy this life that God has given to you. Okay, that's point number one. Enjoy life. Point number two, and this is, there's only two points to this sermon, so you're almost, you're almost there. Number two is enjoy life because life has many good things. Life has many good things. Here's some of my favorite verses in all of Ecclesiastes, verse seven. Go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Enjoy life, because life has many good things. He lists a bunch of stuff here. Did you catch it? Verse 7, he says, I'm going to call it this, uh, the three F's, food, fun, and fellowship. Okay, and I know that's a church word, fellowship. It just means, hey, we're together. We are supportive of one another. We have a relationship with one another. We encourage one another. We have food together. We have a fun together. What a blessing that is. I, I am going to be blessed in an hour by our lunch, okay? I'm going to be blessed by it. Because I like you all, and I like hanging out, and I, I really enjoy food. And, uh, and so it's going to be a good time. That's a good gift that God gives to us. What's your favorite food? I saw the list of things people are bringing, and it's, it's an amazing thing. Um, it's lots of good stuff coming. What, maybe your favorite's going to be there. Maybe you're bringing it. Um, every meal that we sit down with other people and share in should be a reminder to have a grateful heart that the Lord has given us this life. God, thank you. That's, by the way, that's why we pray before we eat food. Because it just gives us a reminder that like, God is so good to give this good food to us. Thank you, God, for life. Thank you for this food. He goes on and he lists, uh, I'm going to call it festivities. Your garments be white and have oil on your head and Enjoy the traditions and festivities that you have. What family traditions are you looking forward to this year? This is the time of year. Are you looking forward to any? I'm looking forward to stopping listening to Christmas music after Christmas. That's what I'm looking forward to. We've been listening to it for three weeks now, and, uh, and my wife does that. But I love my wife very much, very much so. <laughs> Enjoy the festivities. Enjoy the traditions. And then here's the... I love this one. Enjoy the life with the wife whom you love. And uh, what a gift a good wife is. What a, good, what a gift a good husband is. Love your spouse well. Be thankful to God. Be grateful that he has given you someone to share in this vain life together with. What a blessing that is. And I know we have some people who you're waiting for God to bring that right person in. And you're praying for that day to happen. And you look forward to that day and you desire that, and that, that desire is a good thing, we'll keep praying for you, because it's not a sure thing. It's not for everybody. Everybody doesn't get a blessing, but those that do, it is a good thing to have someone in this life to share with. Now, how do you enjoy life with the wife whom you love? I jotted this down, see if you agree. By not taking her for granted. By not taking her her for granted. That's how you enjoy a gift. You don't take it for granted. Men, love your wives in a way that doesn't ever take her for granted. That was a great spot for an amen, husbands. That was a great, too late now. But uh, you, you <laughs> love your wives by never taking her for granted. A spouse that God gives us is a blessing. The weeks go by, the months go by, the years go by, and we somehow take things for granted, say things that hurt, 
argue over things that don't matter. And the encouragement here is to enjoy life with the wife that God has given you. Enjoy life with the husband God has given to you. The last one he lists is work. He already said in the book that work is a good thing. Work can be good. That work can be a blessing of God. That work has a lot of benefits to it. It's not the answer. It doesn't take the place of God, but there is a blessing in work. And here he says, whatever work you do, do it as hard as you can. Work hard at the thing that you've been given to do. And and so find out what you like to do. Find out what you love to do. See if you can do it, and then do it as hard as you can. Do it and work as hard as, as you can as you can muster. Now, the reality is, some of us won't find the thing that we love to do. Some of us won't be given that blessing of doing the thing that we love to do, but we still have to do something, right? We still have to care for our loved ones, still have to take care of our family, and so then you still have to get a job, and then you got to work hard. And you work hard at that job. There's admirable uh, things in working at a job that you don't particularly love. But you got a job, you're making money, and you're going to work hard at it. You're going to be excellent at the job that you have, even if you don't love it, because you know that God's given you that work to do. And you're going to be faithful. You're going to be day in and day out. You're going to work hard until you get enough money set aside so that you can retire and do the thing that you love. We have so many people in our church who are retired, and uh, they really have retired from the workforce, but they've become full-time in the ministry of the church. And I can name a bunch of them. I'm not going to because uh, I'll maybe forget somebody. That's a great thing, a beautiful thing that you've you've worked hard and uh, you've provided for your family and you come to a time where you can actually step away from that job and now you can begin to invest in things uh, that God has laid on your heart to do for his kingdom. Work, whatever work that God has given you to do, do it with all of your might. Now, here's the application, okay? The application for this is this. All of these good things that we experience in life, they should help us to glorify God. They are not an end to themselves, meaning we don't worship those things. We aren't blessed by these blessings and say, man, this is so great. I love this thing that God has given me. We don't worship food. If we do that, it becomes a problem. He mentions wine in there. We don't worship wine. We don't don't say, whoa, the wine is the thing that's so good. And and there's a dangerous thing to that because we can get wrapped up in alcohol, right? So you don't, you worship the God who has given all good things. You don't worship your wife. She can't be God to you. You don't worship your husband. He can't take the place of God to you. But you, you thank God, you glorify God for these great gifts that he has given to you. That's the way that God designed all of these good things that we enjoy in life. That we would experience them and enjoy them and do them, yes. But it would lead us to say, God, you are good. God, we glorify you. God, we bless your name for everything that you have given to us. Fear God. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us. Because he's the reason you're alive today. And he's the reason that you have these good things to enjoy. Fear God. All right, what time is it? 11.31, okay. I have uh, a few more things I'm just going to go through real quick and then then we'll close, okay? Hang in there. As we close, I just jotted down four things. Things that steal our joy and the biblical answer for it. Okay, I didn't even do that this, this first service. We didn't have time. So, um, but I want to I just touch on these. The first one is anxiety. Anxiety. You're anxious about work. You're anxious about your health, about your family, about your future. What's the biblical prescription for dealing with anxiety? Well, realize it's worthless. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he says, who can add an hour to their life? by being anxious. So be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about things. Think about that. That really spoke to me this week because I have a propensity to be anxious about things that I can't control and to think about it. And Jesus says, why do you do it? You think it's going to change any outcome? No, then why are you wasting mental energy? Why are you wasting your time being worried about something that you can't, by being worried about it, change? See, in my mind, I think, if I think about it more, maybe that bad thing won't happen. You know, I'm on top of things. I'm thinking about it. I'm anxious about it. Jesus says the opposite. No, you can't change anything. Just forget about it. Don't be anxious about that thing. 
You say, well, okay. Is that all I should do? No, you should pray. Pray. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Pray about everything. Don't be anxious about anything. Pray about everything. Now, this is the biblical prescription for it. There's other things that you can do, of course. Um, I found that if you uh, get a real good workout in, you kind of tend to forget your anxieties for a amount of time. So work out, that's a good thing. If you have a good breakfast in the mor- morning, this is just practical things that can help with anxiety as well. But realize what Christ says is true. It's worthless. Remind yourself of that and then pray and bring those anxieties to the Lord. Things that steal our joy. Number two, boredom. Boredom. There's nothing to do except scroll through your social media. You've already watched everything. You've binged on Netflix. Nothing to do. I'm bored. It steals your joy. You begin to look around and see things that other people have that you don't have. And so that boredom turns into jealousy. And it just... Have an adventure. Set some goals and get after it. This is what Solomon tells us in verse 10. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Get an adventure. Get a, a goal. Get a vision in mind. And then work toward it. To achieve it. If you're working with all your might, I'm going to promise you something. You'll be, not be bored. You might be tired, but you won't be bored. Things that steal our joy. Number three, toxic relationships. Toxic relationships steal our joy. So choose your friends wisely. Because bad company corrupts good morals. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. And so, iron sharpens iron, so men sharpen one another. Proverbs 27, 17 applies to both men and women. So be careful who is around you. Because the people who are around you, if they're the negative, if they're the people who aren't believers, if they're the people who are going to um, be a negative influence in you, guess what? They're going to pull you down a lot easier than you're going to pull them up. You think, well, I'm strong enough in my faith. I'm a strong enough believer. I'm a leader. I can bring them up. The reality is, no, you will be brought down. Okay, last one. Things that steal our joy, the devil. Evil forces. This is true. Not saying that there's a demon behind every bush. Not saying that there's a devil possessing every enemy of yours. But you will not have victory unless you're on the right team. If you're not a believer in Christ, you are at the mercy of the enemy of your soul the devil and his forces and his minions. So if you're not on the right team, you're going to lose. So join the right team. Believe in Christ. Follow after the Lord. Trust in him. He's the winning team. But even if you are on that winning team, know this, you will be attacked too. The devil prowls around like a lion looking for who he can devour. And so we need to put on the full armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6, to be really uh, willing and ready and able to stand against the devil and his forces. And so I just want to encourage you, um, today's the day that you can make a decision for Christ. Every message in Ecclesiastes, we've been putting this challenge forward. You can make a decision uh, to trust in God revealed himself to us in Christ. I pray that you do.